too, and I'm coming back to that also. You'll forgive. You note that in the Tenth Commandment, unlike the others, there's no specific action that's being either condemned or recommended, uh, neither enjoined nor exhorted or forbidden or prohibited. Instead, we've got the first recorded instance that I know of of thought crime. It's not you're not supposed to do it. It's you're not even supposed to think about it. But this is why those of us who maintain a critique of religion make the charge that it is implicitly totalitarian. It can convict you for things that are only in your head, for thoughts that have hardly begun to form. And there's another reason, I think, why this commandment is somewhat sinister. It appears to forbid the poor from resenting the rich, if you want to make a left critique of it, or if you want to approach matters from a free market point of view, it seems to crush the spirit of emulation and competition that's involved in wishing you had uh, a better life. Um, some Jewish authors have argued that the prohibition only extends to actual neighbors in the sense of those who dwell in the immediate vicinity. And some have said it, it, only, it only applies to covetousness of that sort. But it would surely be a fairly paltry commandment that excused this exact same attitude if it was directed at people further away. And only then do you notice, when that thought has occurred to you, in the mind that you have that's always alive with subversive thinking, you suddenly notice that the children of Israel are precisely and all the time being ordered to covet, being enjoined to covet, being told they must envy and hope to annex the lands, the flocks, the herds, and the women of neighboring tribes. They're kept going by greed by the thought, soon all these people's property will be yours and that you'll be licensed to take it by force and kill them and have the land and not the people. This is perhaps why, this ambition, is perhaps why there are no prohibitions against, say, slavery or rape or genocide or child abuse in the Ten Commandments. It's not a matter of leaving these out or applying situational ethics to a time that was not ours. It's not that, I, th I don't think so. Uh, such things have always been known of and usually deplored. It's more, I fear, that such terrible things as rape, enslavement, uh, genocide, and child abuse are just about to be mandatory. They're just about to be forced on people as things that they are not, not, not just must not do, but must do if the conquest is to continue. The remainder of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, of the Pentateuch, in other words, is largely taken up with exact codification of the different kinds of enslavement of Jewish servants and non-Jewish serfs, the conditions of mass murder and despoilment of other neighboring tribes, neighboring tribes. There are also incidental and, so to say, by the way, commandments such as the one to stone to death any child that disrespects its parents and the prohibition on seething a baby goat in its mother's milk one of those random commandments on which the whole laborious edifice of kosher and kashrut has since been, been raised. So let's just trace again, to be sure where we are, amid this blizzard of conflicting hysterical orders, the evolutions of the Decalogue. After the commandments specified in Exodus chapter 20 comes Exodus 21, a chapter of so-called judgments, which gives the verdict and sentence in advance for any number of crimes, from smiting to slave rebellion, and from ox goring to witchcraft. And these two have the forces of commandment, and the penalty, in all cases, is death. Moses then returns from his audience with God to discover his people have lapsed into calf worship and other frivolities. As I mentioned earlier, he thereupon smashes the two tablets, which would surely at that time have been the most precious artifact that could possibly be known to man, as having been conceived and made holy by God, smashes them and summons the Levites of his contingent to inflict exemplary punishment. And I quote now from Exodus 32, verses 27 to 28. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, so this too is a divine commandment, by the way. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and the fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So that's a, a terrific slaughter under orders. And you note the small inconsistency, which may perhaps I sometimes think betray the prickings of a poor conscience. In the first verse, the order for the indiscriminate slaughter is from God, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. In the second, it's from Moses. 
the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. There's a bit of displacement going on here. We don't know. Um, in either case, it orders the killing of brothers, uh, companions, and in that significant term, as we've seen from the Tenth Commandment, neighbors specified they must die uh, without pity or without discrimination. That's not excessive, perhaps, after the infanticide of the firstborn of Egypt. That's already taken place for them to get this far. And it pales beside the anger of Moses in the later book of Numbers, where he speaks to his generals after the battle against the Amalekites and rages at them for sparing so many of the civilians. Now, therefore, he says, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that has known a man by lying with him. But all those women, children that hath not known a man by lying to, with him, keep alive for yourselves. In the Age of Reason, Thomas Paine drew attention to this passage, saying that it constituted, I'm quoting Paine, an order to butcher the boys, to massacre the mothers, and to debauch the daughters. A fairly good summary of what I've just read. And this earned him a hurt and high-minded rejoinder from the Bishop of Klandaff, uh, a blithering Welshman who used to try to debate Paine on these questions. Um, he didn't contest the butchery of the boys or the massacre of the mothers, but he did say very plentifully that it wasn't actually stipulated that the daughters were being kept alive for immoral purposes. In other words, the bishop left open the possibility they were being kept as, I suppose, pets. <laughs> anyway, after the...